Hi, everyone, and welcome to our One Step Away After Show, co-hosted by legendary Harlem Globetrotter Larry Shorty Coleman and our amazing Douglas Salisbury, our pad warrior chief, and who does our Confessions of a Walkaholic. We're joined by Dr. David Alley as well, and also Thomas, who heroically shared his story. Um, Dr. David Alley is on here for a few more minutes to to share, um, answer any questions that you might have. And also Thomas is here to answer questions. But first, Douglas, Confessions of a Walkaholic for this week. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everybody. What a great show that was. Man, that is, a, Thomas is, his inspiration, his hope, his courage and strength is just amazing. But that's what you expect from Louisiana. You know, that's, that's how they do it. And I was walking the other day and I got to thinking about, you know, what the show was going to be about. And it just reminded me of my, my journey also when, you know, I fell in the yard mowing, the, mowing a friend's yard one day and I knew at that moment that I needed to do something. So I called my primary doctor, you know, and, uh, I, I just needed to check it out. So my thoughts are racing and, and all that's going on. I called, made an appointment for like four weeks later because they couldn't get me in sooner. So I remember sitting in the lobby. Uh, I tried to read a book. All my thoughts are racing and it seems like it's just taking forever. Then all of a sudden I hear my name, go to the door. And, you know, there's the cordial invite. Hello, how you doing? All that. Check my weight, check my height, still weight the same, still tall. And then uh, we got to room three C. I remember sitting down and I remember all the questions she started asking. And I was, all I could think about was I hope I'm explaining myself where she understands. And she's writing, the blood pressure cuff is squeezing my arm, and, and you know, I'm still nervous. And it's like, what's going on? So she leaves. She said, Doc will be right in. So I'm sitting there and I'm looking around the room, all the posters, all the different posters and the medical gadgets on the wall and all that. And I'm thinking, well, let's see what happens. So I wait, I wait. I hear some paper rustling. And then I'm thinking, oh, he's coming in. And then I realize it's the room next door. Oops, I have to wait a little longer. So I'm sitting there, it's getting a little chilly, and I'm waiting. And then the doorknob turns. In comes the doctor with the white coat. And we shake hands, and he says, Mr. Salisbury, why are you here? And then I start explaining all my symptoms again. And we're going through all that stuff. And, and you know, I'm thinking, he's here. My Savior's here. This is going to get fixed, and my life's going to be normal again, and I'm going to move on. And... It's it, it's it's part of that insanity of thinking that just because he has a white coat that he can just magically wave some kind of wand and I'm going to be healed. And it, it's a process in the, that we have to learn to go through. And it's now I know what I know. I know to ask the questions I need to ask. And that's what we need to learn in this. And him, your it's so true. And I almost wonder what Dr. David Alley, I mean, hearing that patient's perspective, right? Waiting for the white coat to come in. What are your thoughts hearing Douglas's confessions of a walkaholic today? Well, that's why I don't wear a white coat. <laughs> <laughs> so so then that is true. There's many reasons about I but my my friend, I, I hear what you're saying. And you're a human being, and 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 and, and, and I hear it. And, and I went through some kidney stones. I did the same thing with you that you had as a human being. And so, what 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 I can tell you is is that 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 you that the patients should be, uh, uh, and they have the right, and they have and they have the, the the really the responsibility to be aggressively. Uh, uh, honest with your doctor and and tell them what's going on and your opinions oftentimes the the doctor will put more stock into that if the the the, the patient appears to be reliable these are real symptoms doc help me and and this will make a doctor i think more aggressive and more likely to help you 
to, to start off with. Depends also a lot on whether it's a primary care doctor or a specialist that you go to. And, and, and the, our health care system is different than it was a few years ago. And, and being just as honest as you can with your doctor earlier than later is always going to be better for you. Always going to be better. And Dr. Alley, is, is, today, is, is there – because I just got out of the hospital. I, saw, I was in there for five days and saw seven different doctors in a hospital setting and kind of got different things each time. So is there that big a difference between being in a hospital setting and because I realized when I got discharged, my, my primary heart doctor that I see all the time is that he was out of he was out of uh, state all week. So the difference between seeing a primary doctor and like going to the ER and the knowledge. Well, that, 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 well that's going to depend on your where you're at, where your ER, the, you know, you're in a big town, a small town. I, what, what I can tell you is our health care system is, is far from perfect, is burdened with, with, with lots of disadvantages. And, and yet, how do you sort that out. What I can tell everybody is, is that, that uh, honestly, um, emergency room visits are designed for emergency problems. That doesn't mean you don't need to go there, but to, but to go there for less than an emergency, you will get some kind of Band-Aid treatment at, at, at an emergency room or a walk-in clinic because that's what they're designed for. And you don't want them treating a major health care problem. Are you following what I'm saying? Now, now, you know, though that's the ER, but that does not mean if you have an acute symptom, you need to go to the emergency room because they they do have the ability to uh, to diagnose an acute vascular problem, and then in that way they put you in the hospital. That may have been what happened to you, and and and, right. and, and then once it, once you get into a hospital, now again it depends on which hospital and and, and what they've got, and that and if there's anything that I can hint to a. A patient, because I see this even in our own, own community. If you have a choice to go to an emergency room, go to one that is connected to the best hospital that has the best, what we call tertiary care, which means if you needed a cardiologist and a heart stent, you're going to be better at hospital X than hospital Y because they don't have that service. You follow me? A smaller yeah. hospital. So in the planning, when you just go into an ER, you ought to go to the one connected to the best hospital. Now, once you get into a hospital, that will depend because now every doctor almost works for a hospital, you see, and they, they got their standards and all of that stuff, and, and, they, and, and you will be seen by non-specialists generally to begin with, and I'm not saying that's good or bad, but that is the way that it is. If you're, you should be seen by a, a hospitalist who is a, is a general doctor who should identify what's going on with you and have a low threshold for immediately having that cardiologist come put this coronary stent in you. If you're coming through the ER with chest pain, if you're coming through the ER with a cold leg, then, then he's going to be sending you to the vascular specialist. So, uh, so I'm, uh, my advice and in, in the, the, the things coming, uh, you know, out of my mouth on your question has to do with you know some some of the the uh, your patients do have the ability to seek the care in their community and know what's there when you need it. Yes, sir. And I have one que a personal question for you. With with mm -hmm. what we've been talking about today, how much pressure do you feel as a doctor when you walk in with somebody like say Thomas? How much pressure was there on you to 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 try and be? that magic, you know, the, to figure out the right answers and the wrong answers and to do it the right way. And how much pressure do you feel? Well, he had Kim McNicholas on his tail. He felt all the pressure in the world because he knows he's my, my miracle magician. So he had a lot to live up to. But I knew I had the right man for the job. Well, you, you ask an interesting question, and we've talked about the problem with health care. And that sort of thing. And there's more of those problems now than there used to be. I, 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 I have been doing this a long time and have been the last guy on the totem pole for patients to see for an awful long time. So I've learned in my own way 
uh, to deal with your, your question, you see. Now, the newer guys coming around, they, they are not going to be have trained. They don't have that experience. They, you know, it's going to be a more difficult thing, and, it's, and, and they're less likely to do what I did and to opt for something else quicker. And that's one of the things that happens in this country every day still in the world of amputations without patients really being seen, having angiograms, having the maximum revascularization. I just went to the NCVH meeting, which I started 25 years ago. The same messages were given 25 years ago. It's not, it's taken 25, and it may take another 25 years to educate everybody. And this is the whole thing that Kim is doing, what the foundations are doing. This disease is is prevalent more so, and and so it's it's an ongoing process, an ongoing process. I do feel pressure, but I'm going to do the right thing for every patient that I can with the skills God's given me. That's a beautiful thing. And, you know, we have legendary Harlem Globetrotter, Larry Shorty Coleman, who's here, and he's had the experience just speaking to what you were talking about, Dr. David Alley, where... He ended up, you know, he, he went to an OBL, but they couldn't deal, take care of him in the timeliest manner. And he was in pain and they couldn't give him any pain meds. So he ended up going to an ER because he just couldn't handle the pain anymore, you know, waiting for this procedure. And Larry, you, you can jump in here and, and share your experience, you know, but going to the ER. And I think he's still trying to connect to audio here. He's having some trouble, but maybe Dr. Alley, you can, oh, and he, he ended up with just whomever was on call as a vascular specialist to revascularize. And, and that's, you know, a little bit of a, a crapshoot. Like, who are you going to get? Are you going to get, you know, someone who has the most advanced limb salvage skills? Or are you going to get someone that um, is more experienced with performing amputations as their form of treating peripheral artery disease. You just don't know. It's, it's the, it's just the ER lottery. This is, this is a true statement. Now the first thing I'm going to ask Larry though, is when did he play? Because I'm an old Globetrotter fan. I'm of that age. <laughs> Meaning well, I saw him play probably. I know. I'm sure you did. Actually, I think he was also in the cartoon. So I think they depicted him in, in the cartoon as well. But his his audio, he's having so much trouble with with audio. So we might have to wait a few minutes to get him. He to was he was it. in the cartoon. He was in the cartoon, right? Yes. Well, guys, what, y'all are younger. What cartoon? Is that something more recent? I'm talking about the old days, the real days. Oh no, these this was the old days. So um, he ended up. He was doing the you know he was a legendary harlem globetrotter he played but then they did a guard cartoon i think was it in the 70s or 80s it was it was in the mid part there because i remember uh growing up in houston seeing him at the astrodome when it was still around so it was i'm 61 so i remember growing up watching them in houston they would come and go and i remember seeing him back then well, guys, I turned 70 this year, so I can remember seeing him in the early 60s. So anyway, wow. so I'm smiling because I'm an old sports guy myself. And so, hell, I'm honored to be, hello, to be hello. on the call. There, there he is. is. Hey, Shorty, you have a Harlem Globetrotter fan here, and Dr. David Alley. Well, first of all, a good, good afternoon to each and every one of you. I don't know what's going on with my phone. I'm having a hard time. And the more I pluck with it, the worse it gets. Anyway, I'm glad to have fans of all sorts, just basketball in life in general. For sure, this is Dr. Ollie. I got a big smile on my face because I was just hinting to them. I turned 70 this year, so I can remember back in the 60s and 70s and before the other guys. So when were you with the, the Trotters exactly? I'm glad you mentioned 70 because that's not me, but that was uh, Marcus Haynes. Uh, ah. Metal Lock Lemon, yeah. Curly Neal, and so forth, yeah. and Lou Dunbar. I started in 1986 to 1993. I see. So, so I've good. I go two generations with you guys because those first yes. 
I did see, you know, in all in, in legendary guys and you too, my friend. I tell you, it was a great job, and I'm glad to have the opportunity to entertain people. Yeah, but I feel so, like so the people tell me you attention. have some vascular problems. I have what? I'm sorry. So Kim, take over because I understand you're going to have him talk about his vascular problems, and I'm anxious to hear. Yeah, so he wanted to. So I was telling him the, before you jumped on here um, that we were talking about just the experience of going to an office-based lab and going to a, a hospital. And you went to an office-based lab. And one of the issues that we had with you is that, you know, in between getting that scheduled appointment for revascularization, you had to do the blood work, et cetera, et cetera, you ended up experiencing pain and the office-based lab couldn't give you anything for that ischemic pain that you were experiencing. And so in the meantime, you were like, I can't, I, I'm staying up all night and I need to go to the emergency room. And in that emergency room, you went there for the pain. And of course they're going to assign you whoever the on-call vascular doctor is. And we were saying that it's just, you know, uh, a lottery. You don't know who you're going to get. You don't know if you're going to get a vascular specialist trained in limb salvage or someone who is trained in amputations. Well, very much so, because when I went to emergency, I'll just start from the very first time when I was experiencing pain in my left calf. Felt like someone was stabbing me. However, being an athlete, you ignore it and think it's a cramp. Well, this cramp went on too long in my mind to believe that it was just a cramp because of the fact the pain got worse. Even though I know things to do to cure myself, I'm not a doctor. However, I went to emergency and just like Kim said, it's like pulling a name out of a hat. First doctor came in, said, you have a blockage. You, we need to amputate your leg. Very discouraging situation. However, I didn't believe him, so they admitted me to the hospital. However, me, my wife, and it was a good thing they were there at that time. However, I stayed a pretty long time up until COVID. That means no one else could come in. Now, I'm facing doctor after doctor, doctor after doctor, and, take, and going under the knife eight times before I decided to say, please just take it off, because I couldn't bear it. That was something, most devastating thing in my life, having that happen. I get teary-eyed thinking about it, but I get the result of thinking other people out there worse off than me. So if that helps you understand it, now I'm fighting to walk again for the third time, once with two legs, once with the prosthetic and my regular leg. Now, I hope and pray I go next week to take more steps, and I hope it works out. So my, my, my friend, first comment to you is, is, is God bless you, and, 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 and hopefully you will be able to get this prosthesis. Mm -hmm. Now, was this an above-the-knee or below-the-knee amputation they ended up doing? Above-the-knee. Above-the-knee, so you had a high amputation. Have they put a prosthesis on you yet? I had a prosthesis one time, and okay. pain, the PAD traveled to my other leg where it got very weak, but I couldn't stand five to eight minutes, and that wasn't going to work. Was, I kept falling. This was my next question to you. One, you're, you're at extreme risk for that other leg, not being negative, being reality. Yes, well, we're just being honest and candid about the situation. My leg is getting stronger. Unfortunately, Kim referred me to Dr. Red, who was a great help. I'm 80% pain-free, and the leg is taking longer to get stronger. And I do go to LA Fitness, what have you, and get in the wheelchair, but I'm sick of the wheelchair at this point. Well, is what's holding you back the leg, uh, the, uh, the amputation, or the other leg? Meaning well, your right leg, or, or is right it both? Leg. It's really both because I don't have the prosthetic to even practice on it. I can only do it when I go to my appointment once a week. Have they assessed your right leg for your vascular status? Because yes. that, did they tell you you have blockage on that right leg? Because you do. I had, I had three 
major blockage, and, and Dr. Ray was able to clear up two, and one is really uh, 80 to 90% blockage, and he said, best for me to get the prosthetic and just start walking, hoping that exercise. Well, that, that seems appropriate because, because that's, you know, you, you've had that other leg addressed too, because you'll never be able to do your prosthesis with the other leg still a problem. So you, it sounds like you, you're on the right track with that right leg, and that'll have to be watched for the rest of your life. You know, as yes. you get this left, yes. le- left leg prosthesis in place and get you, you know, uh, fit to be active again. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, whatever, whatever the good Lord has in pl- uh, stored for me, I will carry it out with 100% of my ability to give it the best. Tim, if, if, I may, if I may interject, because you started this off by telling me that he had a case scheduled in the OBL that I, I guess didn't get done because of certification or whatever he experienced pain they couldn't give him pain medicine now that doesn't make sense to me because the obl is not a physician there are physicians in those obls that could have provided him pain medication to tide him over until he got back into the outpatient to get his leg corrected on the left before ever going into the hospital because well, actually that did not happen i see, for, I see yeah. also that so that's what happen, I was wondering. So. We find this a yeah. lot, though. Um, in what is is disconcerting to us, and I don't know. Yeah. There's a lot of, you know, I, I won't say controversy, but there's a debate as to whether any medication can really cut that ischemic pain, pain anyway. In you know, just outpatient, but we find this a lot that the vascular doctors are not prescribing any pain pills. And a couple of them have told us who have been in the office based labs that they're not allowed to do it. And I'm confused because why can't they, if a patient has to wait a few days for a procedure, I don't know if doctors really understand the extent to which this pain is affecting them. We have a patient that is- This is not brand new. This is nocturnal vascular rest pain. That means he's an advanced RC4, not being technical, but you can't sleep. Now, know that pain medicine is not going to give you blood flow, but it it can help you with symptomatic relief over a couple of days, preparing you to come back to the OBL to get a more aggressive procedure without having to be admitted to a hospital. You you see, I see it all the time. That's very well, that's true. What I'm, I'm wondering, and that's where, you know, not only, um, not only Larry, but so many of our patients, we have another patient right now who's in Indiana yeah. and he's a wonderful person. He's in ischemic pain. He actually said, because I wanted to get him in yesterday, he has an infected foot and he needs serious revascularization, has some gangrene. He's been living with this rest pain for months, actually. And He's like, why do I need to go in today? I mean, I've been, this has become a way of life, not sleeping, intense pain, headaches to go along with it because he's just cringing all the time with this severe ischemic pain, but no one will give him any medication. They said the only solution is to cut off his leg. If I I showed uh, it to a bunch. Those people people need to be seen by somebody with experience that can that can that can juggle the pain medication appropriately as you're being set up for a procedure to give you blood flow to revascularize right. and, and that sort of thing chronic pain in its own self increases blood pressure increases cortisol it is not healthy so chronic pain uh, you, you know is a is a devastating thing in itself. Now that, you know, most of that kind of chronic pain ends up being back or all of that other stuff, but patients need pain relief. In PAD, there is a place for oral pain medications for symptomatic relief within the the, the equation and the, the variables of getting the blood flow, getting the appropriate amputation. You're going to have pain in your teeth if you've got an infected molar until you get it out in a root canal. You see what I'm saying? So, so yes, that makes sense. Is, 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 it needs to be given 
appropriately though appropriately. and and you know in that in that instance as a part of the plan mm-hmm. it's more than just blood flow it's more than just blood flow your dr phillips was asking what should the name of that uh the uh, session we just did the answer in my opinion is it takes more than blood flow are you following so 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 me saving uh thomas's leg was really not about blood flow it's about more than blood flow are you following me? yes so yes, there's multiple, multiple factors here and and we center on blood flow we center on blood flow we center but it's only and it may be the biggest variable but it's not the only variable in saving a limb i want to interject this is, is that that thought that this is holistic so Thomas and, and Larry can accept, both of y'all can understand that roller coaster ride from when this first started to when you met Dr. Alley and he started saving you, you know, started helping you get better. That roller coaster ride that you were on, because we know when we're sick and we don't feel good, how that affects us physically, emotionally, and it, it, it all comes together as a whole. You can't just do one thing without that's the mental health aspects of what we go through in it in that roller coaster ride of it's three o'clock in the morning i can't sleep my one toe hurts you know it's it's that insanity i need sleep i'm tired and it makes you grumpy it, it, it slows you down you know and how does that affect you physically is is that well, to me oh Yes, you can speak, Thomas. All right. Well, with me, that situation with me, um, what Douglas was on about, I went months with pain from this. But it, it wasn't so much the pain. It was more of soreness, you know, in, inside the wound. And with everything going on, I was still at work as well. And I, I, was, I was practically getting through a 24-hour day on four hours of sleep, doing eight hours of work too. And it just got to the point where... It, it was just hard to focus, you know, on everyday stuff. Um, and w- when you do get like that, you want to try and rest as, as much as you can. So I wasn't eating as much as what I should have done. So I, I ended up losing weight through it all and everything else, you know, and that just made a situation, a bad situation worse. And you your know, job, I, you walk a lot on your job, don't you? So Yeah, absolutely. You have a job, you have a job to do. And every step you take, you're you're thinking about how that bothers you instead of trying to focus on what you need to focus on. Even that's at home and all of that, isn't it? Right, and that that's how it was at the beginning before I got this got it all taken care of with Doctor Ali. Um, after getting taken care of, Doctor Ali, I went back to work, and it it it, it was kind of hard for me to begin with getting my steps back again because I hadn't really walked so much. Um, now that I got back into the routine, does it still hurt at times? Yeah, it still hurts, but it's nowhere near as much as, as what it was. I would say it's like 2% now as compared to where it was like 98% before, but the pain was just horrific and I, it, it was just hard in everything I did. Yeah. And Brian, welcome to the show. And I see you shaking your head. Does that, does this make uh, sense to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I wanted to, if I could, just maybe quickly, in a very terse manner, share my scenario with PAD and would love some feedback. So I'm um, 60 years old. I've seen a cardiologist because heart disease runs in the family. So I'm seeing them for 25 years. Had pain in my right uh, leg. Uh, they never did any testing. Well, when, when I finally mentioned it to them, uh, they did and found out that I did have PAD. So seven years ago, I had a Judkins procedure. And unfortunately, my right femur is uh, fully uh, occluded and my left tibia is significantly uh, blocked. So I've, I've changed cardiologists and I did a stress test recently and they did a little bit more um, uh, analysis. Uh, my right leg's the worst. The ABI is 77. Uh, the left is 89. 
And Kim, you've been really kind to uh, provide me with some Houstonians who could uh, offer uh, this uh, help. But what I wanted to ask the group, three things is, um, has it has the technology changed and improved since 2016 with procedures? Um, the other thing was, um, you know, I'm getting conflicting. My, my former call, cardiologist was like, had me on uh, Solastazole. And the new one's like, yeah, we, we don't do that for pad patients anymore. So that's just kind of a, a snapshot. Um, I, I can walk, I can cycle, but my fear is I'm not being proactive on this. And I, I do realize it's a very progressive disease. And I just want to dive back into it. My, my former cardiologist was like, hey, your stress test is okay, yada, yada, kind of punch the, the ticket. So I'll just be quiet and listen, but thank you so much. Well, I can tell you pain medicine. Go ahead, Larry. I, I would say that pain medicine helped up to a certain extent, and they don't want to give you a lot of pain medicine because they, they're very scared, and I'll say it, that you'll get hooked on it and have another problem to deal with. That's the biggest problem they are having. It's not just the doctors, it's the government. You, but they, they, they can turn some people to street drugs, not myself, because I'm smarter than that. As, as Larry, a record, yeah. Go ahead, Doctor Alley. No, no, you go ahead. I, I, I got a couple comments, no. which I'll hear what you got. That's the whole point, Larry. We have to be aware of that. That's why, as a recovering addict for 39 years, as a licensed counselor, yes, there are drugs that are gateway drugs, and we do need to be aware of that. But that, that's just the point that. I'm glad that there are those out there now that are saying we need to be careful with this because, you know, 20 years ago, yeah, it just is a lot different than it is today in that aspect. Yes, it is. Go ahead, Dr. Alley. Uh, guys, a couple of things. Number one, uh, my comments on pain medication, remember I said selective use because there is no question these gateway drugs are a big care problem and and it it ought to be dealt with you know appropriately harshly there's there needs to be protocols and standards that do control these yet yet the selective use in selective patients like him through specialists you see if he comes to an er or they or or, or, or things like that and they're, and they're seen by primary care physicians or er physicians or whatever a non a non specialist trying to save his leg, then the governmental concerns will outweigh the clinical benefit. You follow me? Yeah. So 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 therefore, in in my practice, I have to be aware of of this. Also, I have personal knowledge of the addiction problems in families. I understand where yeah. those come from. M many of them younger patients after orthopedic procedures. So they're always on my mind. Yet. A selective use in patients like like Larry would would be helpful. And and the only other thing is if he was tied into an OBL, that means he had a physician. You just don't go to an OBL and OBL fixes. There was going to be Doctor X, who works at the OBL, and and so the patient always has the the right to call or to contact Doctor X because Doctor X had that ability to to write that medicine as a licensed physician with an intent to help you bridging the pain management to get you into his OBL to provide your procedure. You follow me on that? Yes, I do. So, yeah, so pain management. Now, the, the gentleman with what appears to be PAD, your, your question, uh, has things changed since 2016? The answer is yes. The answer is double yes. So there are technical tools that we have today that are significantly better than what we had in 2016. Yet, the use of these tools in, in, in the decision to treat or not treat has not changed that much. And now, what I'm getting at is this. You, do, you are an active patient with PAD, uh, and it appears that you, you walk, you get around, 
and and you have diagnosed appropriately a certain degree of PAD. You have a total occlusion on one side and then on the other, a more tibial. So, so he has established PAD. The question is, when do you treat it? You treat it when it becomes symptomatic enough in each patient. If you're 93 years old, you can barely go back and forth to the restroom. There's, you're not going to recommend that until you've got a limb that needs to be saved. If you, you my, my friend, you're 60, it appears you're, you're active and you're, you're walking. You have, I would say, mild symptoms. And, and therefore, it would not be really appropriate to recommend an invasive procedure on you at this time unless your symptoms got worse. Okay. Worse to the point that it is disabling to you. Certainly wounds or things like that. But if you're taking care of yourself, the medical treatment that is there today can help you. Okay, that doesn't mean it's going to cure you. We do not have Drano that cleans these out. But we have statin therapy. That is that the, your cardiologist will know more about that than me. We know that it helps. It treats your whole body, and it will also minimize the progression of PAD. Solostazol, okay? That medication has been around a long, a long time. Uh, I still use it. There is nobody who doesn't use it because we just, quote, don't use it anymore. It's not perfect, but it is recognized as, as uh, helpful treatment, it increases the ability to walk. There is data that shows that it is effective and is, a cu- is not a cure, but it's effective. It helps stabilize things. And, yeah, and isn't I it help to squeeze? Would... Doesn't it help the, to make the, the blood cells a little bit more flexible to squeeze through it, any it, narrow it, it has, That's right. It has several different effects, okay? And I'm a believer in it. Okay, I go way back on it, and even we used to use it in primary and stents. Now, there's a dose which is 50 twice a day or 100 twice a day. 100, yep. The only only reason, the only reason, in my opinion, not to use it would be if if there was some kind of reaction to it. And then, you know, that's every every medicine falls into that category. But, but really, the only absolute reason was if you had had a heart attack and you have, have had heart failure or your ejection fraction, which is the amount of heart muscle you have, is low. If you have those, then it's actually a contraindication. If you don't have a weak heart because of all of that, then if you're an average size male, my friend, 100 twice a day, I think would help with maximum uh, cholesterol management. Because you were asking, what can you do to delay it? So that, that is the medical treatment of somebody like yourself who okay. has what I say moderate to stable disease. You're young. It could progress. you got to take care of your legs and your feet and keep on exercising. Yes, sir. Thank you. you, know, you we sir. have a patient that's on it, uh, someone who has a, a CTO of her aorta. And they all wanted to do an aortobifemoral bypass, not even try to go in and um, see if they can take the pantheras or something just to maybe just try and open it up. I sent her to another vascular surgeon. This is like the fourth opinion. And he said, have you tried to stop smoking first? Number two, <laughs> have you tried celostazole? He put her on maximum medical therapy, even with this CTO. And I'm almost wondering, I'm curious for because, you know, in the aorta, you get a lot of just thrombus, right? I'm wondering if with this maximum medical therapy, if it might have opened up a little bit and she's able to walk like a maniac, symptoms all improved. Well, it, 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 if you took an angiogram, you're not going to see any change. Are you following me? Okay. But physio- yeah. physiologically, physical, man, if she quit smoking, hell, that's more important than cholesterol. Okay. So but, but <laughs> going back to cholesterol. Its mechanism of action is well proven. It does improve the circulation in a couple of different ways. No, it ain't Drano. Yes, it can improve symptoms, and there's plenty of data out there that shows that. And I'm faced with a chronic total occlusion of the aorta often, and it's never easy to treat. Surgery is tough. Dense and endovascular procedures for that are very, very hard to do. They're complex. So you don't really treat those patients until you 
have rest pain when they can't walk, okay, or they have wounds and things like that. It, she's probably a small lady. She's a heavy smoker, and she and 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 I bet you she responded to Celestazol because I, I, I that would exactly what I would do. Yeah, we're hoping that this just works. She's a young woman, mother, you know, young mother, and we hope this. We hope that she may never need anything. You know, I had uh, an attorney that she ended up with her iliacs, her external iliacs that were completely blocked. This is so crazy. And she decided to go more on the natural therapy, She, you know, on top of medical therapy, right? So she did that on top of using supplements. She walked every day. She was an attorney and she's 90 something years old now, still going strong, never had a procedure and iliacs have stayed the same and her disease hasn't really progressed. Amazing. What, right? Well, amazing. Yet here's what she didn't have. Okay. I don't know her, but I can tell you this. She took care of her feet. Okay. And she wasn't a, a bad diabetic. So therefore those proximal blockages in those kind of patients can be treated medically. They shouldn't be revascularized. It's the, it's the ones though that have the combination of diabetes and diffuse disease that get CLI. You follow me? Mm -hmm. So there is a certain sub set of patients out there with proximal bad artery disease without diabetes that can be treated yeah. medically, at least as a first step. That's good. You know, what's it, interesting it, is yeah. during the show, you were talking about, you know, when you do actually treat. And it was interesting that um, in, in treating endovascular versus, you know, bypass, and there was a, a case that with, with Dr. Jihad Mustafa, and it's public, it's on his LinkedIn page, so you can see it. There's no secret. He actually did it as a live case over at NCH, NCVH. And it was, the perineal was the only solid vessel that was going through like one vessel runoff. And all the other doctors had written him off and they were going to perform amputation. And I was like, oh no, we need to send him up to Dr. Mustafa. And he showed us all on live that he could do it with ease. What was interesting is some vascular surgeon came back on Facebook with a public comment that's like, oh, great. Yeah. And you didn't, you know, hurt any sort of landing zone it has a great landing zone there in the perineal still for a bypass. And I'm thinking if you have one vessel runoff and you have progressing disease in the tibials and the perineal, in our experience, those bypasses don't last very long. Um, we've had bad experiences with that. I was kind of surprised. You could completely contradict me, but I just from our patients that have come to us and like, wow, they just you you have one vessel down to thing. They just don't know how to and they don't even try endo. They went straight for bypass. And it was like, oh, I don't know about that. Well, it, there are many factors involved with that. OK, m m many factors. And it's it's you had to consider all of those. OK, and, and, and first of all, everybody ain't a surgical bypass candidate. Even though there's a target, you follow me? There has yes. to be a target. But even with a target, there's many other factors. Is there a greater saphenous vein of, of, available? Is the, does the patient have mixed arterial and venous disease and they got huge edema, thickened skin, they'll never heal an incision? Are you following me? So, yeah. so, 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 so there are a handful of patients, even with a good surgical target, that, right. that the risk of during surgery are 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 great okay and 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 so those patients depending upon the anatomy okay and whether it be the first time second time are there occluded stents or whatever it, it, you know yes jihad if he has somebody who has native blockage and that's the only vessel then it's never been revascularized before he don't have stent fractures he ain't got all that other junk the, the, you see what i'm saying traversing that and correcting that is I think the, the generally the way to go, and if done correct, no matter what that other surgeon said, you, you shouldn't take away his surgical bypass if needed. Most yep. of the time, that's a myth. That's always been so, and still some surgeons, and there are some cases, including myself, who I may opt for a bypass, a tibial bypass, but those patients have likely already had three to five endovascular approaches. They have, yeah. we have kept that leg alive for six years. Now it's year number seven. 
their kidney functions are starting to deteriorate a little bit. They, they got a new wound. It's multiple stents and they're fractured. And that's a hell of a tough endovascular procedure. And then is the time you are going to go ahead and pull the bypass if they appropriately have veins, even if they don't have veins. We, we have cryopreserved arteries and veins we do bypasses on now. And, and so that is, I think, the tibial, the, the, the approach by the contemporary younger vascular surgeons who are trained in endovascular and know when to use it and when not. That would be a, a, the modern way of handling that kind of stuff. I have a question for you, Dr. Alley, too. We have a walk-in program, and uh, th th those are that smoking, eating correctly, and the importance of walking. Okay, we, we who whose walking program is it? Who is we? We yes. have one here at the weight of my heart, and it, it okay. It's, it's it's a simple fact. It's called one step away, but it's the it's the importance that we share with each other about the importance of walking and building those collaterals that help us with this disease. Okay, whatever you just said there, my friend, I believe in. I it works. Now putting it into motion in our public and and in our patients has never been so darn easy because the government wouldn't pay for it. And, and so therefore, therefore, there's not a code for it. So it gets lost in all of this stuff. But if you guys and your foundation have it and you can get your patients to do it, because it doesn't have to be in a special center. Are you following? Mm -hmm. And yes. I'm suspicious that that's yes. what you guys have. And if you're asking me, is there a role? There is a role for that program in every single patient who can walk. No matter if they had a procedure or they didn't, there's benefit. You follow me? And that's uh -huh. what we do. We we, we express uh -huh. the importance of walking every day, and and that's part of our responsibility as patients of working with you in the PAD setting that we take that responsibility on. Well, I, I think it's way underutilized. Yeah, we spend an awful lot of resources and time on the end result of that CLI. But, but if we had more people on walking programs earlier, and then once we do fix their leg, we amputate their toe, they are free from symptoms, they need to be walking. That's the intervention the Lord gave us to walk. And, and it's good for your body. It's good for those, the, the blood vessels. There's plenty of data that would show that. Enforcing it's always been the problem. What's about, interesting though is you have someone like like Larry here. Larry, you've always been really active. Um, what was your life active. like, it, Shorty? What was your like life like? I mean, you because a walking program. I'm curious, you know, for someone like him, he's already walking, working out. He, I, you weren't smoking or anything, right? No, I didn't smoke or drink, and it ran in my family, but I chose not to because I wanted to play sports. <laughs> From 11 years old to 62, when this happened in 2020, it was a shock to me. But I said, I've been active a long time. So I just thought this is something that happened. Then I checked with family and family members had the same thing, plus diabetes on top of it. Then it, it no, began. You have diabetes? You have diabetes? To, no, I said my family members had diabetes right. and PAB. And... I didn't have any at the time from 11 to 62 once again. And it was just a total shock when this doctor told me I had peripheral artery disease. And I said, man, I don't even know how to spell that. But nevertheless, I had, I'm dealing with it. And my main focus is to change my nutrition. I was a very poor eater. I admit to that. No smoking, no drinking. But well, guys, every too, one of us, may, may I make a comment? Yes, please. Every one, of us are, well, every one of us are born with a stamp on our head. That stamp on yeah. our head tells us that we are going to live life and we're going to have things affect bones, joints, heart, hair, face, you name it. Brain, it comes over everything. time. 
That's the, well, well, but understand that's the natural process, and, and, and I'm not wanting to be evangelistic, but that's the way the Lord made us. We have disease that progresses slowly in everybody's blood vessels, no matter what. No matter what you do, you don't do. That is what happens to blood vessels. Now, the stamp on Larry's head is number one, he's black. Okay, we know that the, 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 the risks are much, much greater as opposed to almost any other uh, 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 patient population. He can't change that, and neither can anybody else, but it is there. He had a family history, okay? He, 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 and he can't change that either. Okay, he says he's not diabetic, and that is good. I, I bet you he was a latent diabetic, especially if he didn't eat well. If not, you know, so he had these factors that no matter – no matter how much he exercised and he ran and took care of himself, thank goodness he never smoked. Thank goodness he didn't all do those other things because they would have hit him and hit him in his fifties and sixties. And that's what, mm -hmm. what happens to a lot of our athletes, you know, when they get into that age group, Larry's a, a little bit older. So he has simply been a, a, a participant in life and these things have built up on him. And, 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 and that's the, the chronic nature of PAD and why we, we got no cures and why we got to pick up on it, modify it, and treat it. And then once we treat it, we continue to modify lifestyle change because every blood vessel in your body is going to be affected just like every other organ in your body over time. That is absolutely so, right. I agree with that 100%. So, Dr. Alley, that includes the noises that we make now that we're older when we stand up or when we sit down? <laughs> well, it depends upon which which noise you're talking about. <laughs> the noises my yeah. legs make, the noises that come out, uh, 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 you know, can't see and as the well. Answer is, the answer is yes, because they affected the same, <laughs> same as your blood vessels. Why some people get it joint-wise and you know, in the chronic nature of all organs and diseases, you know, that's an unlocked mystery to this moment. But we, but PAD, I don't hear people talking much about the, what, what I just said. It is a part of not natural life, and, and maybe that should be better awareness. Why? Because it makes sense, I think, what I just said, and that might hit home with patients earlier. You follow me, Kim? My hint there? Yes. 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 Um, we do have a question that just came in from Kim in our group. So if you don't mind, Dr. Alley, we'll have another, just one more question for you and let you get on with your Saturday. Um, when you do an ABI test, which is that ankle brachial index with those blood pressure cuffs on your legs and your arms, and they measure the differential. And when they do it with the treadmill, why do the numbers go down when exercising? Is that a bad thing? How often should an ABI test be done if you have an occlusion at the iliac? So I think well, two different uh, questions there. I, I'm going to disclose, number one, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of an ABI. Now, I don't want that to be controversial. I, I want you to, to, to I don't understand. Think it is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, I, I, and in in this discussion, I, I, you know, you, I want it to be known that that ABI has been a test. We've had it for many years. It has some values, yet it has so many so many false negatives and false positives that mean that single number, no matter what, can be affected by other external. Uh, things such as skin thickening, obesity, diabetes, the blood vessel itself, uh, the flow. What is your blood pressure that day? Did you take your blood pressure medicine or did you not? Oh, interesting. So it is a very, very rough estimate. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so if that ABI is real, real low, let's say 0.234, something to that effect, and the patient has symptoms that are appropriate and wounds and things like that. If they can get them, then then that becomes, I think, more accurate. Okay, and and it, no matter what it is, you don't treat an ABI. Okay, it is an indicator that you need more sophisticated testing. Now, once there there could be somebody who has an ABI of zero, and they're asymptomatic. And so, what does that mean? Well, you know, again, that means there could be some false positive, negative, or it could be there's good collateral blood flow. 
and, and so, so the question that she has asked me, I'm going to say I, I'm not aware of any protocol saying when or when you should not use it. But but the way healthcare is, and to get it to get it reimbursed, those kind of things are generally ever six months or so. Now, in the walking ABI, any changes that would that would indicate that there would be some amount of collateral blood flow, which would be good. But again, depending on the medicines you took that particular day, there could be vasodilatation, there could be blood pressure and things. So, so I don't have, and I'm not aware of a great, uh, great diagnostic follow-up and, and tendencies on ABIs. Even though insurance companies want them, everybody wants them now when they didn't care as much, and off the cuff, that's just another barrier that they're putting up. In, 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 in my opinion, uh, but because there's too many false positives and false negatives, and they could be interpreted in a primary care physician or a podiatrist office that they're normal, and they really aren't, or there, is, there are blockages, and, and, and the ABI has a tendency to overcall certain situations, making that single number very hard to, to make any clinical decisions on uh, and dr alley we we tend to ask this question about i tend to ask this question about doctors that we just meet i was curious when you started out in this profession what kind of it was there a certain circumstance that led you into this particular field or was there a moment that you thought this is where i wanted to go or Oh, man. Well, my friend, how, how much time do we have? I might talk for a month on that subject. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's just a curious question. Was there a certain moment in time that you thought, I, I really could? It sounds like your expertise is just, it, it, it's amazing listening to you talk. Well, I don't know about all that, but, but, but the fact is, I was a ball player. I'm a physical education major who didn't know nothing about medicine. Okay, I injured my arm. That was the end of my baseball career. I had to do something, and I tried to get in medical school. I got in medical school. The last guy to ever get in that class, I blinked my eyes. Four or five years went by. I found myself as a resident. I found myself in the emergency room one evening trying to figure out whether I wanted to be a gynecologist, a psychologist. I didn't think long about that one. Or what did I really <laughs> want to do when, when, when I saw – when I saw a trauma, I saw surgeons acting, I saw life saved. I said, whatever that is, that's what I want to be. So I became a surgeon. This was before stents. This was before anything. Okay. So I became a surgeon. And during that training was when the first heart surgeries and bypass surgery, there was no stents or any of that came out. I personally felt that that was my calling. And, and, and I, you know, I was always pretty good with my hands. Uh, I worked hard, not the smartest, but I worked hard with my hands and I made a decision that that's what I wanted to do. And so that is how I got in heart surgery because there was no real vascular surgery back then. There was no vascular grafts. They were just coming out. There was no balloons or stents. There was not a vascular surgery specialty. Okay. The old heart surgeons used to do that. And so during my training, I'm one of the only early guys who liked to do blood vessel surgery also. And, and, and so I picked that niche out uh, of the overall heart and vascular surgery. And when I came to HOMA all of those years ago, there, the cardiologists weren't trained. They, they didn't know the arteries because they weren't trained, okay? I happened to be the surgeon who came with Dr. Walker, and basically I taught him vascular. He taught me the, 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 the skills of endovascular. And so that's how I stumbled into what I do because of the forces going on at that time. And I think that I was blessed to be where I was at that time because I was exposed to the new stuff of, of all and the old stuff I was trained in. So that's, that's a long-winded answer to, to going back 45 years ago. 
<laughs> but we're glad you're where you're at. And before you go, we have one more question for you. And then we're going to let also yeah. Larry do his his final one step away words of wisdom. Um, and because I, I want to let you get on your with your Saturday. But we have an emerging situation. We have Felicia who has messaged me here and she just jumped on. And her boyfriend is currently in the hospital. They're awaiting discharge, but they're still not getting any answers. So she just wanted to run a couple things by you just to see if you had any questions or any direction that they can lead. They're in a very small community outside of Indianapolis. So this community hospital may not have, they might need to be a little, get a little guidance um, with the right questions. So Felicia, jump on in here. Hey, Felicia. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Hi Anna, how, can I, how can I help? Um, Felicia, do you want me to Jim, read what, what you wrote here? Yeah. Okay. I can go ahead and just read a little. I just need your permission to read what you wrote. That's fine. Okay. She, you know, they're they're struggling a little bit right now. As you can imagine, it's very scary. So let me just run through a few things for you. And I apologize if I don't pronounce something right or uh, whatever, but jump in to clarify. So um, her boyfriend has anemia, X factor five, hemoglobin is oh. about six. He was given two pints of blood three days ago. His hemoglobin is now eight. He's bled from the rectal for about 25 years. Doctors can't find a reason why. They keep doing the same test, which all come back normal, had an, a CT of the abdomen. They didn't find any sort of aortic aneurysm or anything like that. For the last six months, he got a couple of iron infusions that was working, but they scheduled his next one three months out when his iron was only nine. Um, so I don't know what this means. So I don't know what this means, Felicia. So three, May 31, I made him go to the ER. Um, they want to do another oh. colonoscopy. Uh, on May um, 30th, uh, first. Okay. So May 31st, you made him go to the ER. So he's been there ever since. And they haven't figured out what's going on, why he's bleeding, why his hemoglobin is so low, I think it's seven, and they want to just discharge him and even give him just a pill cam. You know, um, a nurse practitioner is concerned about possibly make some bleeding internally, but no, she's not sure if they're doing the right tests or if she needs to go to, for example, Indiana University for a grander evaluation for him. Any thoughts? So Kim, so so number one, it doesn't sound like there's really any PAD scenarios, the legs and all of that. That's not the issue. This is a medical issue related to a chronic anemia. Is is in short, that's what she's asking, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So 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 she, so there. This is not brand new. I, uh, you know, without me knowing any more, these things don't just come out of the woodwork. So this means that that he that he's probably had. Uh, ongoing bouts of this, which which means that there's probably a, a family history of it and all of that. And so, so this is not brand new, but these people will c could have acute bleeding at any time, and, and it's very complex. And this, you know, is out of you know my strike zone, so to speak. You know, except I know about medicine, and you know, this takes a very sharp hematologist. This takes the very best of the gastroenterologists and the people who do the appropriate testing, but because even though they can bleed almost spontaneously from anywhere, okay, th th there there are areas that come and go, and they need to be identified and corrected, okay, and that's why they keep looking. They 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 don't know. They can't explain why. I would expect and, and hope that some time in the past this patient has had a bone marrow biopsy which would tell them more about why he is anemic, it's chronic, okay, and, and given iron and things like that. But, but certain, certain things need to be identified to, to how, how his anemia, how low can it get, what should he do, because they're, you know, if it gets too low, obviously they're at risk of bleeding to death or passing out or anything like that with, with this kind of anemia. 
if they continue with this iron, that means they must be they're counting on his bone marrow to help produce some. But it sounds like, sounds like that may not be the case, or it's producing, but he's losing it from somewhere. This is a very difficult problem, and they ought to be going to Indiana University Monday morning. Okay. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's a really very cool. complex medical thing, you know. I can't yeah. imagine it being handled anywhere in a community hospital. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, no, I agree. So probably going through the emergency room at Indiana University might be the best way to go. And I do have someone well, that's on call at, at Lafayette listen, right now. They, 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 Kim, these, these, Felicia and them should have a yeah. hematologist. Okay, and that hematologist should be able to contact the university, and, and there must be a senior hematology group in that state. And then, and it's probably at the university, and and that's probably going to be better than just going to the emergency room at Indiana University. You follow me? Yeah. Yes. That, that sounds good, can, Felicia. I'm, I, I'm saying no, any emergency room who has somebody like this walking in, they're they're hamstrung on what to do. You see, they 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 they, they, they that to make the right clinical decision. You see, they need to have some information, and and, it, and and that could be arranged by the hematologist calling the hematologist. This happens to me. I call the emergency room and, and tell the emergency room, you don't turn this patient away. You call me. I'm going to probably admit him and take care of him from here. That would I be do have an call. IR. Dr. Alley, I do have an IR that's on call there this weekend. Is there anything that an IR can do to help, or is there any way an on well, yeah, part of it. Yes, the, the role of an IR in that would be would be identifying a bleeding point that can be corrected. Now that that now that might be unlikely in him because he's got chronic, you see, a, a chronic disease, a chronic blood vessel, or excuse me, blood uh, dyscrasia, which means it ain't his 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 marrow's not doing the right things, and he stays anemic because for whatever reason he's probably not replacing his blood loss. Yet, they, if there is that, that, the role of an interventional radiologist would be to help identify and correct the problem. This ain't something you just open up a patient and do surgery or do this, that, or the other. Most of those things are correctable by a non-surgical ways nowadays. If there is somewhere that's identified as actually bleeding. Thank you so much. Felicia, we'll continue right. to work Thank online. You. I took some notes, you know, for you. Dr. David Alley, we really appreciate you being here and all your time. You've been very, very generous with it. Um, any any final thoughts? I'm Only glad I, to I, listen I want, to him. I, I think oh. you guys keep doing doing what you're doing. I, I'm, I'm not aware of any other great advocate for our patients like you guys are, are doing, and, and you guys are spending a Saturday also, giving your time to educating our public and, and trying to make a difference. Thank you. And Amen. Larry wanted well, to say something. Yes, oh. I thank you very much as well as the rest of the family. And Felicia, we will be praying for you. Let's all find peace within today and throughout the week. And take it just one step at a time in one day, because nothing is promising. Prayer helps 100% for me and others that believe. So God bless each and every one of you. Amen. 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 Amen.